Three break-ins in three weeks. Southeast Portland comic book shop loses thousands to thieves. I hate to I hate to sit on this stuff, but I think it's uh I think it's important that you kind of look at, you know, exactly what's going on because there's so many people that are basically saying, ah, it's okay. It's not that bad. So let's get through this one. The owner of a comic book store in Southeast Portland is frustrated after the third break-in in three weeks. John Thomas has owned Disc Heroes for 10 years, selling vintage comic books and an extensive variety of Magic the Gathering cards. The last three weeks has been the most difficult. I used to love comic books as a kid. I just, I kind of didn't really, after I became a teenager, I think I just kind of lost interest and moved on to something else. I don't know. I used to have a whole bunch of comics. I loved them. They were fun. You got a lot out of them because, you know, those comic book authors, they always, they always put little stuff in there and you're like, oh, what do they mean by this? I don't really know. January 16th marked the start of a wave of break-ins in which he lost 10,000 bucks worth of product. That's got to be an enormous amount of money in a comic book store. Comic book stores, I mean, they're not, they're not working on huge margins, right? Buck for a comic book. I think comic books were like 25 or 35 cents when I was a kid. I, got, I bought a lot of Archie comic books. Those were pretty cool. Those are pretty fun. And we had, I think, a whole bunch of Marvel comic books. Um, you know, just random stuff. Who was it? The Silver Surfer that was in the movie Breathless with Richard Gere. Never really got into that series either. They threw an an a blue anvil. It's a tool through the bottom door window and crawled through the door. Thomas said they came behind the counter and cleared off all the books on this rack. This came through and bashed out the guy's comic books. Is there, is there nothing holy anymore? I mean, leave the comic books alone. Uh, go after maybe a bookstore. I don't know. Comic books, though? Nine days later, it happened again. This time, he caught the thieves on camera. Surveillance video shows a sedan parked and two people in frame. Thomas said they used a crowbar to open the back door and steal more books. They stepped on the glass display cases and shattered them. Just under a week later, his store was hit for a third time. Video shows three people stealing more books, sealed product, and a whole case of statues. Each one of them had a tub, and each one of them had a specific spot in the shop and started dumping product into the tubs, Thomas said. So this leads me to believe this was this is organized retail theft, right? This is targeted. Somebody bent into the store. They knew where the stuff was. They drew a little map. All right, you go here. You go here. You go here. This is organized. This isn't just a, well, there's a store. Let's run in there and let's just get some stuff. They knew what they were looking for. They had a game plan. They were organized. That's the organized part of the whole retail theft, right? Organized. Getting away with a total of over $30,000, including a comic book worth five grand. I know comic books go for a lot, and I know there's collectibles out there. Five grand for a comic book. I hope it was in one of those plastic sleeves, right? I oh, know people collect records too. People collect everything, right? There's a market for everything. Thomas is now working harder to keep his business safe, taking matters into his own hands. I will probably be sleeping in here, he said. All right. You know, this kind of goes back to the last podcast I was doing, which you probably couldn't hear. Uh, need insurance for losses. I think insurance companies are going to stop insuring Portland. I think that's I think that's a story in the next six months that insurance companies go hardcore, commercial insurance companies that are insuring businesses, you know, commercial uh, buildings, commercial space. I think insurance companies, that is something that you will hear because you're looking at the data and that's all that they do. They don't have an obligation to insure everybody. And then are we going to blame lack of insurance in Portland on racism? Maybe. Portland's pretty white, isn't it? Pretty white. That's just not a that's just not a thing. So this guy is gonna be sleeping. I'll probably be sleeping in here. It kind of goes to you know, you move into your house and you have gunshots. Going back to the prior podcast, you move into your house and you have gunshots. Well, that was kind of my first clue. And then, you know, crazy people following me home. You know, I'm mostly tolerant, I'm mostly compassionate, but 
you know, the crazy people following me home and then the toxic smell that my kids had to endure at their school because, you know, people in homeless encampments were burning up their tent. And, you know, I don't want my kids smelling that. That would be, you know, again, the least of my kids' concerns. Like, no, you're not going to school there. Ah, it's a hell to the no. So I'll probably be sleeping there. Thomas said that if his store gets hit a fourth time, this could put them out of business. How many times does it take before you're like, all right, yep, this is a no-go. We're moving. And I think that's where a lot of folks are at. I know a ton of folks are at that in, in uh, Seattle. I had a uh, quick conversation via email with somebody down in Portland, and they were saying, hey, this building is this percentage empty. This building is this percentage empty. And if this business moves out, this building is going to be 5% empty. It's happening. I mean, it's going on. You're watching it kind of unfold right in front of you. It's going on. And, and this is all to do with the tax base. So what's going to happen to make this kind of criminal activity? What's going to happen to make the three break-ins into this store go away? What's going to happen in the near future to have that, you know, to, 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 to make this situation better? I don't see anything. I don't see anything. So you got to ask yourself, if you're a commercial insurance carrier and you look at the number of break-ins, somebody wants to renew their policy, are you going to go, oh, okay, yeah, sign me up because I want to, you know, we're going to triple your policy and we know that you're probably going to get at least one or two more break-ins. They're, they're going to back off. They're just going to start backing off. And I haven't had a ton of feedback on that, but I have had feedback that People have had policies canceled, but they were able to get another one. Yeah, it was more expensive. But you're going to see a situation where insurance is going to become so expensive in these areas of Portland that it's just not viable to have. And then if you don't have insurance, oftentimes it's very difficult to rent commercial space. You've got to have, you know, space I'm here in Bellevue, you've got to have a, a, a policy to cover kind of, you know, everything going on just to lease the space. And if you can't do that, you may not be able to rent the space. Now, you know, they may not be able to rent the space anyway because of all the boarded up windows and all the broken glass and, you know, people living in campings outside. Those are the kind of areas where this is going on. And um, even if they don't have, you know, encampments, people know where the commercial centers are. And I think it was Woodstock in Portland. I did a um, podcast on the other day where the, you know, the, the owners of the, um, yep. Yeah, spot on in the insurance, the, the insurance is a huge, huge thing. And that, and that's what people will start to look at. And the, you know, the carriers will say, Nope, we're no go. And then people are all right. So if I move my store to here, but this guy, this, the, 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 the comic book guy, he's going to sleep in his store. I'm sorry, whatever business I've got going on, it's not worth my life. I'm out of there. Yeah, somebody sent me an email saying with this storyline and said he should be sleeping with his friends Smith and Wesson. Yeah, but then you're getting in a shootout over your business, which is selling comic books. I, I know it's your life's calling and I know it's what you do and I know you love to do it. Is that worth it? Yeah, a guy's going to sleep in his store. I would be. No, we got to move this bad boy. If we want to continue doing this, we're going to do some research. We're going to close this down. We got to move this. And I think that's what you're seeing in mass happening right now. So you'll see the insurance aspect of it. And then you'll start to see the lack of tax revenue because all of these businesses, they all, you know, there's sales tax, there's excise tax. There's, you know, taxes on all the services, all the other businesses that come in. It's all part of that ecosystem. When you start to take out various chunks of it, it's not going to go well. Like I was talking to my dad yesterday about the $5 million per black individual that qualifies for it of, re of reparations in San Francisco that had been proposed. And then city officials said, ah, it's not enough. Five million bucks, not enough. Where's that money going to, you know, say that did go through, where's that money going to come from? Well, it's certainly not going to come from the city budget, is it? Because, you know, city budget's going to be hurting because of the whole pandemic, shutting down. That money takes a while to flow through. 
And when you've got a downtown tax base that is, you know, people have left, people are working remotely in San Francisco, they're not there, all the other little businesses are having a tough time, there's not enough, you know, there's tons of office space that's, you know, uh, available. Some of these areas, you've got 30% vacancy, 30%, basically one out of three spots is open. When you have that kind of vacancy, I don't think we even had that during the Great uh, Great Re- uh, Recession. You'd get into the mid twenties, maybe the upper twenties, but thirty percent. Maybe in some cities you did, but most of the cities that I kind of kept track of, you didn't even have that there. Businesses still on the commercial end kept going. Now vacancies in residential developments, yeah, those were bloodbath. I remember doing appraisals where various cul de sacs, depending on where they sat you know, in the economics of the area, you might have four or five homes out of 10 that were empty, you know, foreclosure, various stages of short sale, that kind of stuff. So when hard times hit, you know, things get crazy. Another thing you're going to see, and I'm going to start doing some podcasts on this is the real estate market is starting to come back. Here in Seattle, we're starting to see above price sales take place, meaning you got escalation clauses, you've got multiple bid offers, you've got very little inventory, interest rates have come down under 6%. And before you know it, we're going to be back off to the races again. And I kind of said this would happen by sometime, you know, mid spring, it's already starting to happen. We're already seeing transactions, because people have gotten used to the idea, all right, interest rates are no longer that low. They're higher. We're going to have to figure out how to make this go, we're going to have to do it because people are always buying and selling in, you know, no matter what, whether it's relocation or whatever happens. So that's happening with the residential community. But as far as commercial goes and the tax base that those support, yeah, real estate took a massive dive here in quarter three and four because interest rates more than doubled. And this is kind of a little backfill to that story. And so um, it's been super slow. Uh, Through the holidays was super slow, but now we're kind of getting back on track. And that's Seattle. Other markets, you're going to have a tougher time because interest rates impact um, markets more. Each, Each market's a little bit different. But there's still not enough inventory out there for all the buyers that, you know, if they want to get into it and if they have to make a move, well, there you go. But commercial, commercial is having a tough time because of that whole work from home thing. And then you've got stuff like this going on in Portland. And this guy says, I call it semi-retired. I get to do what I love every day of the week and enjoy it, says Thomas. I don't get rich doing this. I do it because I love it. Do you love having your place broken into three times in 10 days? That's not exactly my time, you know, my idea of being semi-retired. But again, these are people running businesses that have been there years and years and years And, you know, they probably voted in a lot of the politicians that are there and they're okay with it. They're kind of stuck with it, right? Whereas other people that are a little bit more mobile or who it's hitting their taxes a little bit more, you're going to tax me what for getting what? It's kind of like I talk about the group of businesses down in the Castro district down in San Francisco, who are basically saying, we don't want to pay taxes if you guys are giving us nothing. You know, we had that podcast where the guy was the business owner was, you know, hosing down the homeless woman out in front that was causing a big ruckus. How long does it take before you're like, no, no, thanks. I'm out of here. I'm not going to deal with this. This guy here, three break-ins in 10 days. I'd be out of there. I'd say, this is not worth it. I would not be sleeping in my shop because, you know, if it happens three times in 10 days, the odds of it happening a fourth time, significantly high, right? Significantly high. Do you want to be in there when somebody breaks in? I really don't. You're not going to be able to call the police because it's going to take them forever to get there if they're able to show up, depending on what else they've got going on. So, you know, I go back to what's it going to take to turn this bad boy around? It's going to take a lot of what Portland doesn't have. It's going to take a lot of what Seattle doesn't have. It's going to take a lot of what San Francisco doesn't have, and that's backbone by politicians to make some decisions that are not real popular with their constituents. Their constituents know they need changes made, but they're just, you know, at this point in time, why aren't the police showing up? You know, they haven't quite, hasn't quite kicked in. 